All right. So welcome to uh, Dear Editor. Um, today we're going to talk about hijacked journals and how to avoid them. Um, this is, as with all the Dear Editor topics, it's, it turned out to be pretty interesting. Um, if you haven't been to a Dear Editor se session before, mm -hmm. uh, we are from the Research Medical Library, and the Dear Editor sessions are a conversation series on scientific writing and publishing. So we pick different topics um, around writing and publishing. And if you have things that you'd like us to go into or talk about, please you know, reach out and ask us. We're happy to help. Uh, my name is Larissa Gann, and I'm a medical librarian. And my colleague, Don Schiller, um, is the associate director at the library of and manages all of our scientific editors. So um, if you haven't used the library much, check us out. We're at mdanderson.org forward slash library, and we're here for you. Uh, we also have a team. So if you have questions about writing and publishing, you can contact the library anytime but you could also crowdsource a little bit on the Dear Editor um, team. So today we're gonna to talk about hijacked journals um, and let's dive in. And Don, stop me at any time or ask me questions if I miss anything, okay? Um, the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna do a poll and I'm gonna ask you if you know what is a hijacked journal. Can you see the poll okay, Don? Yes. Okay. So if you don't mind just answering the poll. Give it another second or two. It's a very dramatic term, hijacked. <laughs> but it's real. And we have almost everyone has answered it now. So I'm going to end the poll. Wait, there's another one. And I'm going to share the results. OK, so a hijacked journal is a fraudulent journal posing as a legitimate journal. So it could potentially have moved to another country. It might potentially have no clear scope. And often it, it it's all over the place. And sometimes it does have an ugly website, but it's definitely a fraudulent journal uh, posing as a legitimate journal. So let's talk about it a little bit more. Close the poll down. So what is this hijacked journal? Um, it's a type of predatory journal. So if you haven't heard of the phrase predatory journal, I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably have. It's just a type of it. It's a very specific type. What they do is they copy the exact title of a journal. So predatory journals often pick general titles, but hijacked ones will copy the exact title usually. They even take the ISSN number of that legitimate journal. So if you don't know what an ISSN is, it's kind of like an ISBN or a PMID. It's a unique identifier for that specific journal. And we use ISSNs in the library for a lot of identification purposes. It's not easy to get one. You have to go through a process to receive one. Um, but what these hijacked journals will do is just copy the title, copy the ISSN, so you think it looks pretty legitimate. They may try to actually mimic the look of the legitimate publication as well. So you click on it, you don't think too much, and it looks pretty pretty normal like you would normally see. Um, what their goal is is to fraudulently, what they typically do is they fraudulently offer authors an opportunity to publish quickly. Um, they're created by unscrupulous individuals to make money. So their whole goal is to make money off of you. They're relying on the fact that you need to publish, you need to get this research out there, and they offer you this quick turnaround. But what they're doing is just taking the funds, and there are consequences for that. Um, typically how they work is they create a duplicate website of a legitimate journal. Again, they'll use that ISSN number. They'll use the title. Sometimes they'll even use the exact same URL. There are ways that they can do that. It's it's a little bit more rare, but sometimes they do that. Um, they will even sometimes post the impact factor from the legitimate journal as well, even though they are not legit and they don't own, they don't have that impact factor. They do the same thing that a lot of journals do. They solicit you through email. They ask for manuscripts. They say, hey, can you give me one in a week? Um, you get these all the time and you get these from legitimate journals too. So this can be a little bit tricky. Um, most of these solicitations are predatory in nature from a lot of journals, unfortunately. 
They're going to ask you for a fee, but they're not going to provide editorial oversight or proper peer review. They're not going to market your publication for you on any of the social media sites or anywhere else. And they're not going to index it in major databases like PubMed. So in some cases, they're going to accept payment and they don't even publish the manuscript. This does happen. They'll, they'll ask you for money. You'll give them five, six hundred dollars and they don't even publish the manuscript, which is obviously um, pretty, pretty frustrating. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is the fact that sorry, my notes were down. Um, a lot of these hijack journals, but predatory journals in general, um, they'll also ask you to be on editorial boards. So this seems great, right? Because it looks good on your resume to be on an editorial board, but essentially they want your name. They want the reputation of the institution so they can post that on the website and look more legitimate. They may ask you to be on the editorial board and then do nothing with it. Sometimes they don't even ask you. They just take your image and they put it on the website. That, that has been known to happen. They also do um, solicit you to attend conferences. And this has happened a couple of times recently. I've um, actually talked to a couple of faculty members this week who've been solicited by predatory journals uh, to present at conferences. What they'll do again is ask you for a fee. You'll go to this conference either virtually or in person. You're just, you're, you're paying to present and you present um, to other people who have paid to present. So it could be, the topics could be all over the place. Um, so it's not just journals. Sometimes they're asking for editorial boards. Sometimes they're asking you to join and present at a conference. Please ask questions if you have questions. If someone asked me about a specific journal, I'm gonna, um, I'll, look, I'll look at that later. I don't wanna go into the specific ones yet. So here's an example of a hijacked journal, because I figured you're going to want to actually look at an example. This was posted on the Clarivit website. Clarivit owns the impact factors, if you're not aware. They also own Web of Science. So this was an example that they um, found. A faculty member published in this journal, and I forgot how to pronounce it because it's in like Norwegian. It's like Jokul or Jokulsh. Um, I apologize if I butchered it, uh, but basically this faculty member uh, received a notice. Do you want to publish in this journal? He said, of course, it's a great journal. It has an impact factor. I want to publish in it. Um, he paid $600 to get his paper paper published, only to find out that he published in, inadvertently, accidentally in a uh, hijacked journal. So can any of you tell which one of these screenshots is the legitimate journal? Anyone know? Anyone want to take a guest? The one on the left side? Okay. S some other people said right. Someone said the one with the snow. <laughs> I think, yeah, one on the right seems uh, legit. Okay. 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 So um, this is the actual correct one is the one on the right. Um, what this person, what they think happened with this person, I'm sorry, um, had a pop up there. What they think happened with this faculty member is he went and Googled the, the journal uh, he clicked on the first link he found, had the ISSN, had the name, had the impact factor. This is it. So he published in this journal accidentally. And then that research is essentially, it's lost because it didn't go in the actual real journal. It could happen to anyone. Sorry, I'm getting a weird pop-up. I apologize. Um, so this could happen really to anyone. So I wanted to also mention this idea of a cloned journal. Um, so sometimes a publisher will do something similar to hijacking, except they will legitimately purchase the rights to a journal that's real that you've heard of. What they do, though, is they don't note the change in the ownership or the publication standards. So this has happened before. The most 
A popular example of this is Omics. Um, Omix Publishing Groups was around for a long time. They sold their name to someone else. That group became predatory very quickly. They didn't note that the sale occurred um, and they changed their standards. So clone journals, you know, they can seem trustworthy, right? Because you recognize the name, you've heard it somewhere, um, but they do the same thing. They publish without proper editing, peer review, or promotion of your work, which is important. And again, clone journals are less likely to be indexed in major databases like PubMed. So this has happened to faculty here. I have had faculty members call me and say, why is my journal not, my article not in PubMed? Because it wasn't a legitimate um, journal. Now, not everything's in PubMed, right? So like there are things in biostats or physics or sometimes in vet sciences that don't end up in PubMed. But in the cases that I've seen, it's because it wasn't, it was a potentially predatory or suspicious journal. It wasn't indexed in PubMed. So it doesn't show up in those search results that we're typically looking at. So there's also this idea of website spoofing or phishing. There's all sorts of scams out there. So journal um, domains or web addresses may be changed slightly to trick authors into entering sensitive information like password or financial information. So an example of this is this idea of sciencemag.org versus sciencemag.org. One has an E and one does not. That's something easy. Any of us could look and think that it looks totally normal, but it's not. Um, and some of these predatory and hijacked journals even get these URLs in major databases like Web of Science, which we use for impact factors. Um, they will somehow get these into these databases. They'll slip past the reviewers. And then an author thinks they're in a legit database, but clicking on a legit um, link, but they're not. So uh, sometimes the goal of this is to get you to log in and give information, right? Just like any kind of phishing attack, there could be a mal malware goal. There could be the goal of getting your money. Um, and sometimes it's because they're getting clicks and clicks are ad revenue. So they want you to click on that URL. And even if you don't fall for it, you've just given them a little bit of ad revenue. And we're not talking about millions of dollars, but some of these people um, are living in countries where a couple hundred bucks is a lot of money. I mean, it is a lot of money um, for a lot of people, but it's we're not talking millions of dollars. We're talking hundreds of dollars, but that is a click that you're giving them some ad revenue on. So that's something else just to, to be aware of. Okay, we're gonna do a second poll. I'm gonna launch it. So what are some red flags indicating that a journal has been hijacked? And Dawn, I'm gonna pass this one off to you. Um, I'll, I'll um, share it and then pass it off to you. Okay. Okay, so did everyone get a chance to answer? Looks just, like almost everyone did. Just about everyone. Okay, so a variety of um, responses here, but it looks like most of you were correct in saying that any of these things could be indications that um, are red flags that the journal's been hijacked or otherwise predatory in nature. Um, vague email solicitations, the promise of a quick turnaround time, the lack of peer review or editorial oversight, and charging a fee without providing a service for that fee or uh, providing a service to the standard that is expected for that fee. So we're going to look um, a little more closely at some of these uh, ways that you can spot a hijacked journal. Um, I want to just start by saying that when um, when I first heard about this practice, I was really surprised. It seems so brazen <laughs> to me <laughs> to just take the journal name and the ISSN um, and 
yeah, they're, they're just, it's, they're not, they're going beyond, you know, trying to look like a legitimate journal and, and mimic them to outright, you know, stealing the name and the, and the ISSN. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is like Larissa said, they're, um, they're just trying to make money and they don't, you know, they don't expect, they're not in it for the long term. So they just want to, um, you know, be up and running long enough to to get some money and then move on to to the next scam. So um, I think I think one big takeaway from all of this is just you know this whole um, idea of trying to scam people in scientific publishing. It just keeps changing and evolving and getting more and more sophisticated. So we all have to be really careful these days and be on the lookout. But um, so some of the things to look for. You know, when you're uh, when you get an email solicitation, like L Larissa said, um, legitimate journals do this sometimes, usually in the context of, you know, something like a special issue or a series of articles on a particular topic, or maybe uh, they want you to write an editorial on a topic that's been in the news or something like that. Um, so really, the first thing. Um, to pay attention to is if you get an email solicitation and, and your first thought is, why are they sending this to me? Why is this journal sending this to me, asking me to write about this? Then, then that's, that's maybe a good indication that you should investigate further um, because the legitimate journals will actually uh, you know, do their homework and identify people who are experts in the field and target, you know, send them or ask them for very specific things because they are experts. So if you get just like a general request for an article, or if you get a request to write about something that's outside your scope of research, or the journal is outside your scope of research, then, you know, big red flags there. Um, also the email itself, does it look like it came from a professional journal? Um, is it, you know, does the formatting look right? Is the writing correct, or is it, or is there some weird formatting um, errors in the writing, or just you know oddly phrased sentences? So pay attention to that. Um, if you do have you know suspicions about the email at all, um, then definitely don't click on the link that's provided to the journal website. Um, use the journal name, do a search in Google and see what comes up. You know, Larissa mentioned if more than one entry comes up, then you should investigate and um, determine which one is the correct one. And one way to do that, and I was impressed that, um, that most of you were able to identify, I think, the fake journal in the example that Larissa showed, um, because I thought it was a pretty good, it was a pretty Good looking homepage, uh, better than, than I would have expected, more sophisticated than I would have expected. So, um, so that's good. Um, and that's, you know, that's the first thing you want to look at is the homepage. How does it look? Um, do the images seem, you know, high resolution, is layout what you would expect from a professional journal? Um, Larissa mentioned the ads, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, most journals websites have ads now, but um, if there are just an excessive number of ads or um, if the ads are in no way related to, you know, science or biomedicine, then that's probably maybe a red flag, something to pay attention to. Um, can you find the name of the editor in chief? Do, can you find his contact information beyond um, an email address? So, you know, a physical address and a phone number. Um, one big thing to look for is, um, is the email asking you to send the article to, uh, to a web or to an email address, um, because these days almost all of the journals have submission platforms where you, um, you know, you log in and you upload your article into their system and then they, um, you know, they send it to the editors and the peer reviewers, um, and, and get it through the process that way. So if the journal doesn't have a submission platform, um, that could be an indication that it's not legitimate. And then, you know, you can look even deeper and actually open up some of the articles that are on the website, uh, see how they look. Does the formatting look good? Are there lots of errors? Uh, again, 
you know, uh, does it look like it's been peer reviewed and or um, edited? And at any step in this process, if you have a question or um, you want more information, the librarians are here to help, the editors can help. Uh, we work together to try to find, um, find you whatever information you need in that regard. Oh, so there's a question. Um, do some of these uh, use editorial manager platform tools? So that's a good question. Some of them might. Um, what I've noticed um, is that the websites are getting slicker and slicker, and I'm not sure if it's just easier to create a website than it used to be. Um, but that's why we, when we kind of analyze these, if you ask us and we analyze them, we analyze them on multiple points. So we're not just saying, oh, the website's ugly, it's not legit, or they only do this one thing. Um, so it is possible that they use an editorial manager platform tool, but probably less likely because it, that costs money for them to do that. But it is it is possible. It's a good question. So what happens if uh, if you are if you do happen to be fooled by one of these um, journals and you have your article published in it? Um, unfortunately, there are um, some some pretty uh, serious consequences. One is that um, because the journal is not likely to be indexed in PubMed or Medline, um, you're not going to get credit for um, the publication, for example, in your H index or your citation count, and maybe not uh, for promotion and tenure um, if they're looking at that closely as well. Um, and then also if you've, you know, signed an agreement with a journal and paid them to publish, then it could be very difficult to, once you found out that it wasn't the journal that you thought it was, it could be very difficult to get that article back and then publish it in a legitimate journal. Um, difficult, if not impossible, um, in some cases. And then again, um, these journals aren't very careful with your with your manuscripts or your or your um, articles. Um, they're not going to, you know, be looking to have in some cases have peer review at all, or maybe just a cursory peer review. Um, probably don't have any copy editors on on staff. I would say. Um, so, so there's the possibility that some things will slip through, um, errors might be in the manuscript and it gets published and then it reflects poorly on, on you and on the institution and is detrimental to scientific integrity in general. And then again, we mentioned that these are not um, permanent uh, entities, they're, they're kind of fly by night operations. And so if they um, get ordered, you know, get found out and ordered to be um, shut down by the real journal, or if they just decide, you know, they're about to be found out and want to um, stop, then um, then they'll just shut down the website and whatever was on it is essentially lost. Because again, it's not indexed in PubMed, um, so you, your article can't be found anywhere at that point. Was there a question? Yeah, there was another was question. There? So. Um... They, uh, they said, I know that legitimate journals commonly solicit reviews and editorials. I'm not sure they solicit research manuscripts as often. Is the type of manuscript being solicited a clue to the journal's legitimacy? So I've seen them, uh, they will solicit anything. I think, I don't think, and they, they solicit more and more. Um, so I don't think the type of thing they're soliciting, sometimes the topic area uh, will be a clue. Like if they're asking you, one, I've had them call me doctor and I'm not a doctor. I've had them ask me to write on topics that I definitely have no expertise to write on. Um, so those are big clues. But one of the newer things they do is they just take an article you published and they ask you if you could do something similar. So it seems, again... Like, oh, I did publish that. I did that work. Um, you just want to double check and verify. So I wouldn't say the type of research, uh, the type of solicitation matters really that I'm aware of. So thinking of predatory journals more generally, 
is there something the equivalent of deals now that um, we should be looking at is the cables, predatory reports, uh, uh, the best source? Yeah, so cables took over the, the original list for predatory journals, if you aren't familiar, was um, created by someone named Jeffrey Beals. Um, he was sued so often that he stopped making that list. Um, so this company, Cables, which is actually based in Texas, by the way, um, they have taken over this predatory list. And we do have access to the blacklist of journals. What I will say is there's no such thing as a comprehensive list because they're like spammers. They know how to change their look and their feel so quickly that there's no amount of, um, I don't know if there's enough people <laughs> to, to catch all of them. So we do have the blacklist, but I would say it's a multi-point check that you have to do um, to, to identify them. Right. And one of the sources here is called Think, Check, Submit. And that was put together by um, several industry publishing organizations, including the Directory of Open Access Journals. Yeah. And the ISSN. Um, and they came together. So it's been uh, it's been vetted um, and tested. And it's just a it just takes you through questions about the journal um, to help you make a good decision about the quality of the journal and whether or not it's a good match for you. Um, another thing to look for is uh, PubMed indexing, which we keep bringing up. And then um, you also, you know, again, they, they will um, not be honest about whether there's actually an impact factor or if it's, if it's, the real impact factor. So you can look that up on the uh, Journal Citation Reports uh, website. Um, as Larissa mentioned, Cabell's has a predatory reports list. Um, they they don't call it blacklist and whitelist anymore, which yay. Um, it's so the the bad list is the predatory reports. Um, and it's it's good because it it not only names um, the journals that are um, potentially predatory. It also tells you uh, the reasons, their uh, the uh, characteristics that they use to make that determination, and the specific characteristics that that journal has, that each journal has. So you understand why it's on the list. Um, the uh, publication retraction watch also uh, has a list of hijacked, specifically hijacked journals. It's just a spreadsheet where they have they have like the real journal name and the real journal ISSN and then the fake journal name and the fake journal ISSN, which is usually identical, and then the fake journal URL. Um, and there are currently about 160, I think, journals on that list. Um, but, you know, as Larissa said, it's, it's changing all the time. So um, that can't be the only your only source, but but as she mentioned, all of these things together can help you come to a good decision about the journal. Thanks. And then I'm trying to advance, Larissa, it's kind of slow. There we go. Did you wanna talk about the takeaways? Sure, sure. Um, so I think if, if we haven't hammered it in enough, just be aware that there are hijacked journals out there. They may appear to be reputable um, and steal some of that same metadata from it, sometimes the URL even. They can pay for the domain of the URL. It doesn't happen often, but if a journal doesn't re-up their ownership of a URL, it, it can happen. Um, so you can avoid issues by verifying the journal before you submit. You can do that the ways we mentioned before. Try Make sure you're Googling it or checking a, a verifiable source. Confirm the website address. Check the resources that Dawn just mentioned. And the other thing is you can ask a librarian. So, you know, sometimes I can spot them, but as I said before, it is tricky. They have gotten sneakier and better at this. So we do a multi-point check, just like Dawn said for that think, check, submit list. Um, and we can answer those questions for you. So if you just feel some doubt or some discomfort with the journal, check in with us and we can double check for you um, because it's better to know ahead of time so you don't have to try to figure out how to withdraw that, um, that article from the system. 
So does anyone have any other questions you want to ask? Um, Kate, who's also one of our librarians, mentioned another resource I'm going to add to the handout that I'm going to send after, and it's called Pubs Hub. And that's another um, tool that we have that has a list of, of journals in it with, with more information about the journal. Um, it's a verified list. There's lots of tools that we use. So um, we love to look at all of these different lists and tools to verify for you. So please feel free to ask. The main thing is we want you to stop and think and ask or, or investigate. If you wanna know more information just about writing and publishing in general, we have a newsletter called The Right Stuff. It's really amazing current information on grants, on writing, um, on just super important stuff. So I will send out the subscribe link to you guys afterwards if you wanna subscribe. It's quarterly, so you're not getting it every week or anything. It's really good info in it. And we also have the archives um, in our open works um, platform as well. So you can look at the, the previous issues. And if you want, you can join our dear editor team and um, ask us uh, questions there. You can also just come to the library's website. We're here for you um, and ask anything you need. Everything you ask from the library is completely confidential. So um, don't hesitate to ask. So Dawn, you want to hang out for a minute and just see if anybody has any other questions? Sure. 